Serving the amateur radio community with weekly, reliable amateur radio news for the past 24 years, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1249 of This Week in Amateur Radio. There are leadership changes in the AWRL Atlantic Division. We will have them for you. The FCC releases a database map of piracy enforcement actions. A World Radio Day transmission is scheduled from SAQ, the Alexanderson Alternator, in Grimton, Sweden. The AWRL Foundation is accepting applications for grants this month. The USA Radio Orienteering Championships are set for April 19th through the 23rd this year. Young Kentucky amateurs have amateur examination costs underwritten by the FCC. An amateur astronaut captures a dazzling time-lapse video of the Green Comet. Scientists are able to steer lightning strikes with a high-powered laser. Broadcasters and the FCC face off on how to modernize the current emergency alert system. The Digital Library of Amateur Radio and Communications at the Internet Archive tops 51,000 entries. A defunct satellite and rocket stage nearly collide in orbit, posing a potential worst-case scenario. The National Association of Broadcasters tell the FCC that the transition to the new television standard is in peril. Global harmonization of the RF spectrum is paving the way to World Radio Conference 2023. And you will never guess where Morris Code is making a comeback in popular music. We will tell you all about it in this week's expanded report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about how technology is homogenizing the world, and the New York Times claims the internet didn't turn out the way it was originally planned. Australia's own Arnold Benshoff, VK6FLAB, and Foundations of Amateur Radio will talk about something unique to the world of RF, and that is free space path loss and very small numbers. Our own amateur radio historian Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill will continue with part two of his series on the history of amateur radio repeaters. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will teach us some more antenna and tower vocabulary. And we will have a talk by legendary amateur and rock and roll Hall of Famer, Bob Heil, K9EID, who invents things for Heil Sound. We will hear how amateur radio made his history with rock and roll musicians possible. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, this week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Albany, New York, and sitting in for the vacationing Don Hewlett, K2ATJ, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in freezing Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. Why did the chicken cross the road? To get to the other sideband. Reporting to you from just outside the capital of Albany in Glenmont, New York, this is Bob, W3BOO, Boo Radio. And reporting from a bitterly cold Troy, New York News Bureau, I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where, after a string of freezing, icy cold days, we're headed for some warm weather. Seems spring is poking its nose into the tent. Nah, old man winter isn't done with us yet. So says Punxsutawney Phil. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off the news this week, 
The ARRL Atlantic Division has new leadership. We learn more in this report from John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report from League Headquarters. The ARRL Atlantic Division has new leadership now. Tom Abernathy, W3TOM, who had served as ARRL Director representing the Atlantic Division since 2015, stepped down on January 6, 2023. Vice Director Robert Bob Feliglio, K3RF of Medina, Pennsylvania, is the new division director. ARRL Section Manager for Maryland and D.C., Marty Pittenger, KB3MXM of Owings Mills, Maryland, has been appointed Vice Director by ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR. Famiglio was initially Atlantic Division Vice Director from 2015 until 2017, appointed in 2019 to fill a vacancy, and then elected unopposed for a term beginning in 2021. A practicing lawyer, he has served as an ARRL volunteer counsel for decades. Famiglio is also an electrical engineer and former broadcast station owner and engineer. He is an FAA certified pilot, he is a life member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, and he has earned his amateur radio license in 1967 and is an ARRL life member. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. In an email to the Atlantic Division members in early January, Abernathy said he still plans to be involved, stating, After having served for over 20 years in ARRL elected offices, it is my intention to remain very active in support of ARRL, and I wish everyone all the best as we head into the future of amateur radio and ARRL. Pittager was the section manager for Maryland and D.C., one of seven ARRL sections that make up the Atlantic Division. He has an extensive background in radio, served in the U.S. Navy on submarines, and works for a federal agency in his professional life. Assistant Section Manager and Affiliated Club Coordinator for Maryland and D.C., Christopher D. Van Winkle, AB3WG, has been appointed Section Manager by ARRL Field Services Manager Mike Walters, W8ZY. Famiglio and Pittenger will each serve the remainder of three-year terms ending December 31, 2023. A database and map displaying pirate radio enforcement actions taken by the FCC has gone live as part of an overall response to the Pirate Act passed by Congress. The agency says it was posted late because of delays in funding. The database shows the agency's actions over the past three years following the Act's passage and includes consent decrees, landlord notice letters, and the $10,000 forfeiture associated with pirate radio operations. The commission said it was delayed until now in implementing the Pirate Act because of funding delays and challenges posed by the pandemic. The funding covers the cost of other actions, including enforcement sweeps and in-person investigations. To comply with that mandate, the agency needs to hire additional field agents and buy a half a dozen mobile direction-finding vehicles. Although the FCC has already posted openings for five agents and a field council, its purchase of six mobile direction-finding vehicles has been delayed because much of the funding remains delayed. Implementation of the Pirate Act was expected to cost $11 million, according to the Congressional Budget Office. Funds were not provided until last March, and only $5 million was available to the FCC at the time. The Pirate Act mandates enforcement sweeps in the top five markets in the country. The Act also strengthened the agency's enforcement ability, permitting it to take action against those landlords and managers who permit pirate operations on their properties. To take a look at the map, visit opendata.fcc.gov. In honor of World Radio Day, which is February 13, 2023, Radio station SAQ in Grimtown, Sweden, and amateur radio station SK6SAQ are scheduled to be on the air to send out a peace message to the world using the unique 1924 200 kilowatt Alexanderson alternator on 17.2 kilohertz on CW. Test and tuning transmissions will begin approximately at 1300 CET, that is 1200 UTC and SAQ will be on the air for 20 to 30 minutes. Startup and tuning of the Alexanderson alternator will begin at 1530 CET or 1430 UTC, and transmission of the peace message from SAQ will start at 1600 CET or at 1500 UTC. SK6 SAQ has picked a set of unique frequencies with a connection to SAQ's transmission frequency on 17.2 kHz 
and will be QRV between 1000 CET, which translates to 0900 UTC and 1700 CET or 1600 UTC on the following frequencies. 3517.2 kHz CW, 7017.2 kHz CW, 14017.2 kHz CW, 3755 kHz on SSB, and 7140 kHz on SSB. QSL cards will be available, and there will be live coverage on YouTube. For more information about the World Radio Day event and SAQ Grimtown, visit their website. There are two new Yesu transceivers in use at AWRL headquarters in Newington, Connecticut. They arrived via a generous donation from Yesu USA. The company has donated an FTDX 101 MP and an FTDX 10, both HF through 50 MHz transceivers. In arranging the donation, Yezu Vice President, Sales and Credit, Gary Doshe, KN6APR, urged that the radios be used by AWRL to educate and assist your visitors and especially young enthusiasts for ham radio. We appreciate the value that having this equipment available for members and visitors to see and explore will provide, said AWRL Director of Operations, Bob Nauman, W5OV. These are two of the top three performing transceivers on the Sherwood list, he added. The FTDX101MP was named for Yezu founder Sako Hazagawa, JA1MP. The model holds a place of honor in service in the first operating studio of the Hiram Percy Maxim Memorial Station, W1AW. AWRL members and visitors come year-round to tour the station and operate the equipment, most of which has been donated by generous manufacturers over the years. The radio is already receiving a lot of attention from visitors, said W1AW station manager Joe Garcia, NJ1Q. Some of our recent guests have included students and scouting groups who've enjoyed trying the new radio, adding to the overall wow factor of the station. We're grateful to Yezu for this new addition to W1AW. The FTDX10 has been installed in the new AWRL Radio Lab, W1HQ, where it will contribute to the station's ongoing role in the development of innovative amateur radio station design and function. The Radio Lab is an extension of AWRL's equipment testing program, which supports product reviews in QST Magazine, said Nauman. Putting the latest in modern radio technology through its paces is the intent of the lab. It represents what is possible if the modern ham were to go with cutting-edge technology and integration. The Yezu FTDX10 fits perfectly in that environment. Nauman says the AWRL stations will benefit significantly from the donations of Yezu's highly capable rigs. It demonstrates the important partnership AWRL has with amateur radio manufacturers to educate and inspire our community. The AWRL Foundation is now accepting applications for grants to amateur radio organizations. The grants program awards limited funding to organizations for eligible amateur radio related projects and initiatives, particularly those with a focus in educating, licensing, and supporting amateur radio activities. Youth based projects and initiatives are especially encouraged. The AWRL Foundation Grants Program accepts proposals on a cyclical model three times a year in February, June, and October. Proposals for the February grant period are being accepted through February 28th. Awardees will be notified approximately one month after the closing of each cycle. Additional information and a link to the grant application can be found at www.arrl.org slash amateur dash radio dash grants. Registration is now open for the 22nd USA Radio Orienteering Championships. John Ross, KD8IDJ, has more in this report. And in case you're wondering what orienteering is, well, it's quickly becoming the new name for amateur radio direction finding. The event will be held April 19th of the 23rd at Cooper Lake State Park in Texas and is hosted by the New Mexico Orienteers in Albuquerque, New Mexico, using maps provided by the North Texas Orienteering Association. The White Rock Lake Amateur Radio Club will provide communication support for the event. The name Radio Orienteering has been transitioning to its new name, but it is actually the same radio navigation sport known as Amateur Radio Direction Finding. That sport involves using special radio receivers to find hidden transmitters in timed events. USA ARDF co-coordinator Jerry Boy, WBA WFK, said the event is open to everyone of all ages, and three medals will be awarded for first, second, and third place in all groups. 
We have events beginning with what's called the Sprint, said Boyd. Participants will have 60 minutes to find their transmitters. After that, three more events since the Fox O, two classic events, all lasting three hours. And results of the competitions on April 20th through the 23rd will help determine the members of Team USA who will compete in the ARDF World Championship scheduled for the fall of 2023 in Liberec, Czech Republic. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. Charles E. Charlot, NZ0I, the USA ARDF co coordinator, said they are hoping for a good turnout. It is difficult to estimate attendance this year. We can accommodate up to 100 persons, said Charlot. Historically, we've had about 35 or fewer competitors in non-pandemic years, but we are hearing rumors of many people who are eager to get out and do things, so perhaps attendance will be up this year. Charlau said, This year everyone participating in or attending the event will need to pay a $5 parking fee at the park. Detailed information about registration Links to the event site and more information about radio orienteering is available on the ARRL website. One radio amateur club in Kentucky is making full use of an FCC measure that helps cover costs for amateur radio candidates under the age of 18. The Paducah Amateur Radio Association is encouraging local youngsters between 8 and 13 to join the club's program, which it calls Preteen Talkers. The goal is to help them take the FCC licensing exam and get on the air. Last April, the FCC and the Amateur Radio Relay League announced a negotiated agreement permitting volunteer examiners at amateur radio clubs to waive the $35 license fee for applicants under the age of 18 and to reduce the $15 ham radio testing fee to $5. Club Secretary Michael Durr, KN4TIP, told TV station WPSD that those who pass the entry-level technician exam will become eligible for a free handheld radio to be given to them by the club. A North Carolina broadcaster loses two towers due to vandalism. This recent incident coincides with a dramatic increase in metal thefts, said the North Carolina Association of Broadcasters. Police are investigating after vandals brought down two local radio towers belonging to WSJSAM, according to station officials. The Class B station signal is down, as is an FM translator at 101.5 MHz. Three other translators are not affected. WSJS serves the Greensboro, Winston-Salem, and High Point markets in North Carolina, with a 5-kilowatt directional signal. It airs a talk and sports radio format. According to WFMY News, a TV station based in Greensboro, the North Carolina Association of Broadcasters issued a message to member stations about the vandalism, writing in part, NCAB has recently heard reports from several association members of perpetrators intentionally damaging communications towers and stealing copper from broadcast facilities and tower sites. As has been reported to us, at least three radio sites in the Triad area have been vandalized. In one instance, a tower's guy wires were cut, leading to a tower collapsing. These recent incidents coincide with a dramatic increase in metal thefts with copper, bronze, brass, and aluminum all being targeted according to law enforcement. The FBI is also involved in this case since it's a federal crime. The only free monthly amateur radio e-magazine in Ireland is preparing to mark its second year of publication. The Connacht Regional News Magazine is seen as the voice of ham radio experimenters, innovators, and homebrew builders. It has gained a following in Europe, the United States, and a number of Pacific nations. The latest edition features a worldwide news roundup as well as articles about various antennas, the 5 MHz band, and awards from the National Radio Society of Ireland. A number of clubs have also written updates on their activities, from fundraising walks to annual general meetings. The editor, Steve Wright, EI5DD, said that the goal from the start has been to promote radio activities by various clubs and societies from both sides of the border in Ireland. The independent publication also reports on the Irish Radio Transmitter Society 
and the NRSI, the two national societies in Ireland. Steve said that the magazine is distributed free and is easy to access from the qrz.com page of EI0CL or EI5DD. It also appears on the Galway VHF group blog and on the magazine's own Facebook page. Over the last two years, the magazine has grown from a six-page publication in its earliest days to a full 30-page offering. According to Next TV News, the National Association of Broadcasters said that without some action by the FCC, including sunsetting the requirement to broadcast in both the current ATSC 1.0 and Next Generation transmission formats, that Next Generation format, the new ATSC 3.0 transmission standard, is in peril, and with it, broadcasters' future. Earlier this week, Nexstar Media Group CEO Perry Souk and other top broadcasting group executives met with Federal Communications Commission Chair Jessica Rosenworcel and other commissioners and staffers to make their case for that action. They said that a stalled transition, it's been seven years since broadcasters petitioned the FCC to allow the transition, represents an existential threat to free, over-the-air broadcasting. For one thing, NAB said, 4K, which ATSC 3.0 allows, is growing across other platforms. For another, they argue, they need a firm plan for phasing out the FCC requirement of the wasteful dual transmission in both ATSC 1.0 and ATSC 3.0. ATSC 3.0 allows broadcasters to deliver ultra-high definition television, immersive audio, emergency alerts that could wake up sleeping devices, more localized content, targeted advertising, data casting, and more. As the transition continues to stretch out, Broadcasters risk losing sports and other high-value content to pay TV platforms that are permitted to employ more advanced technologies, they told the FCC officials, according to an ex parte document supplied by the NAB. NAB said it's committed to making sure viewers can still see free, over-the-air television before, during, and after the transition. There are converters that could help with that. The television standard is not backward compatible with the original digital standard ATSC 1.0. The NAB said the actions it wants are for the commission to demonstrate the FCC's commitment to the new standard so tech companies will build the necessary sets and converters, without which the transition may be stuck. The NAB also wants Rosenworcel to create an ATSC 3.0 task force to focus on key transition issues. Having a person or group of people whose primary focus is on solving these complex and important issues would enable the transition to proceed as quickly as possible while protecting viewers, NAB said. Back in June, the FCC sought comment on how the transition was going. Every four years, radio communication authorities and experts gather to update the radio regulations, the international treaty governing the world's radio frequency spectrum, and increasingly crowded satellite orbits. At these quadrennial radio communication conferences, or WRCs, member states of the International Telecommunications Union review and sometimes revise both the way specific portions of the radio spectrum are allocated and the coordination, notification, and recording procedures for frequency assignments. These negotiations and agreements also typically paved the way for introducing new radio-based services and systems all over the world. The next World Radio Communication Conference will be taking place in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, from November to December 2023. These negotiations and agreements also, typically, pave the way for introducing new radio-based services and systems all over the world. The next WRC, taking place in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, from mid-November to December 2023, represents a crucial decision-making juncture. Humanity's shared digital future depends on a growing number of devices, services, and products that rely on the limited radio frequency spectrum. ITU Study Group Counselor Philippe Albanu recently explained the complexities underlying the planning and preparation for this relatively little-known yet highly consequential global conference. Spectrum harmonization reduces the potential for harmful interference. This enables interoperability and international roaming, allowing citizens to use the same device in different countries, explained Albanu, in October at the World Radio Communications Seminar. Crucially, it also supports reliable emergency communications, an increasingly important consideration given the worsening impacts of climate change. To facilitate efficient regulation of the radio spectrum, the world has been divided into three regions for the allocation of frequencies. These are Region 1, covering Europe, Africa, and most of Northern Asia, Region 2, covering the Americas, and Region 3, covering South Asia and Australasia. 
International Telecommunications Union member states collaborate in preparations for its major conferences, including four WRCs, through six different regional groups. The Asia-Pacific Telecommunity, or APT, the Arab Spectrum Management Group, ASMG, the African Telecommunications Union, ATU, the European Conference of Postal and Telecommunications Administrations, known as CEPT, the International Telecommunication Commission, CITEL, and the Regional Commonwealth in the Field of Communications, RCC. Each of these regional groups work to establish their regional positions ahead of each World Radio Conference. The six regional groups also periodically exchange views, consolidate positions, and resolve potential differences on WRC agenda items. The most recent interregional gathering highlighted possible solutions related to key WRC 23 topics. The third and final interregional preparatory workshop ahead of WRC 23 is set for the end of September this year. The European Conference of Postal and Telecommunications Administration's Short Range Device Project Team, SE24 Meeting Number 108, took place January 9th through the 11th, 2023. The International Amateur Radio Union participated in the work of the group on several work items associated with wireless power transfer for electric vehicles and ultra-wideband automotive radars. The impact and standardization of wireless power transfer technologies is being carefully assessed across the lowest HF bands and the impact of the ultra-wideband technologies is relevant in the amateur service allocations in the millimeter wave bands at 76 GHz, 122 GHz, and 134 GHz. The IARU Region 1 continues to fully engage in the ongoing studies associated with wireless power transfer to ensure minimal impact to our lowest HF bands. The IARU made a contribution to ensure the amateur service voice was heard in the discussion to finalize draft ECC Report 351 on spectrum sharing studies on millimeter wave ultra-wide band radar systems. Draft ECC Reports 350 and 351 were finalized at this meeting. AMSAT's Gridmaster heat map has served as an individual guide to grid chasers using satellites for those activating hams who need to be aware of which grids are in greatest need. AMSAT says in its weekly service bulletin that the maps may be going away unless a replacement manager can be found. Paul Overn, KE0PBR, will be stepping down after three years at the helm of the project in which he tracked grid rarity based on crowdsourced data from hams who updated him. Paul's Twitter feed, at Gridmaster Heat, displays a color-coded map of grid rarities ranging from green, the most common, to red for rare. The map plays an especially important role in the pursuit of AMSAT's prestigious Gridmaster Award. This honor is conferred on any amateur around the world who works all 488 maidenhead grid squares in the 48 contiguous United States via satellite and has those contacts confirmed in writing. AMSAT is looking for a volunteer to assume Paul's post. The candidate should be capable of collecting crowdsourced data and transferring it to a spreadsheet or some other format and providing updates every week to satellite users. For details, visit www.amsat.org. That's www.amsat.org. From the Minneapolis studio, I'm Kent Peterson, KC0DGY, one of the pioneers of microphones for both amateur radio and the audio industry is Bob Heil, K9EID. Bob has been the manufacturer of high-quality microphones for amateur radio and the broadcast industry from his Marissa, Illinois facility near St. Louis since 1982. Bob is one of the real cheerleaders of ham radio, second only to Gordon West, WB6NOA. During the live town hall meeting at the Dayton Hamvention, Bob spoke about the enormous influence ham radio has had on his life since age 15. Like most of you, I got so infatuated with ham radio in those days. I'm 15 years old. My mama took me down to Walter Ash and bought this TBS 50D and the SX99. And my gracious, it's all of these wonderful things you heard. And then all of a sudden, I hear the most gosh awful signal. And it took me a long time to figure out what it was. Now, this is six meters in 1956. It was single sideband on six meters. 
and I finally figured out that it was K0DGE. Now, he's on sideband, I'm on AM. Well, I was 50 miles from St. Louis. That was a pretty good trick to do ground wave in those days. Well, he was just blown away that I would take the patience and time to do this. I didn't know who this was on the other end. So every night at 7 o'clock, we made a schedule. And he'd be making changes because he was building this 6-meter single sideband transmitter. And here I was on AM. Over the years of time, we got to meet. That person was K0DGE Larry Burroughs, the head engineer of CBS St. Louis. And so... I became really, really involved. I thought, wow, this would be cool if he'd build this for me. So finally, one day, my mom dropped me off at the station. Well, he says, I'll help you, but I'm not building it for you. And he taught me how to build. I learned how to solder on the back halls of KMOX. You couldn't do that today. The unions wouldn't let you. But then it went from there to wherever. It just went nuts. I put up 128 elements in 1959. Bob Drake called me. He says, can you come here to our Dayton Hamvention and talk about that? I'm a 19-year-old kid. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Here was Bill Halligan in one room, Wes Shum in another, downtown at the Biltmore, 600 people. And I just absolutely centered my life around ham radio, not knowing what an incredible institution it was because that was my college education. It just went from there. Everything I did was based upon ham radio, geography, speaking skills, just being able to talk to people. It was amazing what you do in a little town of 2,500 people. To really speed this up, I, I got involved in the rock and roll sound world, kind of a backwards deal. I was playing the pipe organ all those years. When I became a ham, I had already been at the Fox for a year and still playing word or pipe organs, but that's where I learned to listen. Listening is a mental process. It's an art. And I was very, very honored to be able to learn that art from tuning and voicing that word or pipe organ. That's what gives me a lot of the credibility to be able to do what we do today. How would I do it if it wasn't because of ham radio? Well, let me tell you another little instance that's really wild. I opened this little music shop. I quit playing nightly. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was teaching ham and organ. You know. All of a sudden, this guy comes in, and he's got this fender. Well, to me, I was out on my car. I didn't know what this thing was. It was an amplifier. I said, what's this? He said, well, this is a music shop. I said, well, uh, you know, we teach piano and Hammond organ. Well, I got this thing broken. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Being a ham, oh, wait a minute, you know. No was not in my vocabulary. I turn it around. It's got a pair of 6L6s and a 5U4. That was what was in my Harvey Wells, okay? So I said, well, what's wrong? Well, I knew what was wrong. He tried to make it go to 12, and it only went to 10. <laughs> he blew it up. The 5U4 was all gone. Turned the chassis upside down. Screen resistors were burnt. I put in a pair of 6L6s, changed the screen resistors. I had them in my junk box. Every ham has a junk box. You throw away nothing. And it wasn't a half an hour I had his amplifier going. This guy went crazy. He said, oh, wow. How did you know to do that? You didn't even have all them schematic things. No, I didn't need that. I was a ham. Well, then he went on to tell all of his buddies up in St. Louis, first thing you know, it's REO Speedwagon and it's Michael McDonald. Now, these were kids. They weren't REO Speedwagon yet. They weren't Michael McDonald that you knew yet, but they all went to school around there. I became the guy because I had a soldering iron. <laughs> to this day, I've never tasted beer or smoked a cigarette, and I've spent most of my life with some of the biggest drug addicts in the world. <laughs> However, I respected what they did. I didn't have anything to say about their personal life, but when it come to that stage, I owned it, because I had soldering iron. Jerry Garcia called me one day and says, hey, we've got all these speakers on the stage. I mean, we had seven semis full. I guess it was a lot. <laughs> 
how else do you get 50,000 watts of power? And who else but a silly ham would put 50,000 watts of power together on audio? We were the first. I didn't know that. I thought that's what you had to do. And so what did a ham do to get the speakers off the stage? I went and bought some Roan 25G. Jerry Garcia was thrilled to death. He didn't have speakers on the stage. I invite every one of you the next time you're at a concert to look up and tell me what you see. And every time you do that, it wasn't Bob Heil, it was Ham Radio that gave me the idea to be able to do these crazy things. And my life would not be even close to what it is. I'd still be playing a Hammond organ for a hundred bucks a week in a Holiday Inn, trust me. And having a lot of fun at it, but I wouldn't have quite changed the world the way that we have. We got into this business 22 years ago because I didn't think things sounded right. The same reason I got into the audio world then. I thought, man, this stuff, I didn't like their music. I did, I'm playing Jesse Crawford, stuff of the 30s and 40s, but I respected what those kids did. They were talented. And I know you're going to say, well, yeah, they played those louds. Well, but they needed to do something with their sound, and we helped them with that. And so many things, the talk box that I invented, and we were the first guys to build the live console and all this. And, and, and to wrap it all up real quickly, uh, I got a call from the guys in Cleveland, and they said, we'd like for you to come up and go through the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I thought, ooh, this will be cool. So I went there, and we had a meeting with the curator, and he started reeling off stuff he knew more about me than I did <laughs> like whoa how do you know that well you did this yeah you have that console yeah you were the first guy to do a modular power amp yeah uh-huh you yeah you have some of this stuff I said yeah this fall the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is putting a display of Heil sound in their building <laughs> thank you I'm not here to get your applause. I certainly appreciate it. But please, before you did that, you should have given them a thought. That wasn't Bob Heil. That was the entire community of ham radio. It was that energy. It was whatever it is that drives me, that still drives me. It's that spirit spirit of ham radio it's still there for me what's really sad is that the newcomers to this hobby don't see or feel that spirit sometimes and that's the sad part if we had a thousand gordon west and a thousand bill pasternax a thousand dave bells all these guys that have the same type and more energy of me wonderful but we don't and that's what we have to go out and be the evangelist. I'm not just one of a kind. There's a lot of me out here. And it, I just wish the rest of them would come on forward and tell you what all ham radio has done for them. Because it's just amazing. And, and I really hope that you guys take this in the, the way that I say it to you. Because I'm not here to brag about anything. If anything gets bragged upon, it's this hobby. Because I wouldn't even have a clue of what's going on if it wasn't what I learned with that crazy Harvey Wells that still is on 3880 and 3885 every night. I still have it going. But anyway, we have a lot of fun and I hope that you guys can go out and help us create even more excitement because there's a lot more to do. I have had a very honorable and blessed life and it all started because at the age of 15, my buddy in high school was uh, taking a ham radio test. What's that all about? So I joined him and just magnificent things happened because of that. And I've met such incredible people through the way. And it's been my college education. When they did the display at the Rock Hall, they said, do you have any one thing that you'd like to do or show? And they had already picked out some of the magnificent things that had happened. And I said, but I have one request. What is that? And I said, when you do the signage, you make sure that you tell the public that my education was amateur radio. Amateur radio is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> I never forget it because I've worked in such magnificent studios and arenas with some of the great engineers of the world and they're always asking me well wh what college did you go to where did you learn how to do this wow this is fabulous how do you I, I i'm just ham radio no 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 where did you go to college ham radio what well, you don't understand i said no 
you don't understand. Ham radio is the greatest educational thing in the world for technology because we aren't afraid to do anything. <laughs> As most things happen in my life, Joe Walsh was with the James Gang and I was put there just a couple of years after I got into this crazy business and we didn't know we were hams for a couple of weeks. And all of a sudden, we figured it out, and our relationship changed. You can't walk on a stage and move a microphone stand. You can't move a cable hardly. He and I, oh my goodness, right in the middle of a song, he'd come over and say, you ought to try to do this. Let's do that. Let's do that. And, and we were constantly, constantly changing things and experimenting. And that's what Ham Radio brought to us, and it continues to do that. I'm very blessed by all of this, and we continue today in new technologies, as we showed here. New technologies of a headphone. What do you mean, technologies of a headphone is a headphone? No, it's not. Paul Klipsch was the father of the hi-fi sound system of the hi-fi days back in the 40s and 50s. The man was a genius. In 1970, I got a phone call one day, and I picked the phone up, and he said, that you, Heil? And I said, yes, sir, who's this? Uh, there's a Clips here. And I'm going, Paul Clips? This is God on the other end of this phone. <laughs> I, what can I do for you? He said, you've got a guy who's got that 50,000-watt PA? And I said, yes, sir, I want to come and see it. He couldn't believe it. Nobody had done that yet. I didn't know that. I'm a ham. I was just doing what Walsh and I needed to do. And it was all because I wasn't afraid. That's what brought so many things to me. And now some of Paul's wonderful things he taught me about tuning speakers and the enclosures are now in our new headset. It's going to change the headset world. We've never had that before. And I never thought about doing it until a couple of years ago. It just one day, boom. My wonderful wife, Sarah, owns Heil Sound. I just invent stuff for her. <laughs> I'm very serious. She's an incredible business lady. She takes very good care of me. It's been a great relationship. But you think back about all of these things that happened in all of our lives, and you look back at a hundred years ago, what were we doing? Where was audio in those days? It was very, very poor. And as along into the 20s, a 10-watt amplifier was huge. It was a big deal. And then you came along with another ham radio guy that was going to Notre Dame. He watched the football team trying to practice and Newt Rockney was screaming at them on top of his little tower. And they couldn't hear him. So this ham radio guy built a little amplifier. Of course it was tubes. And he built this thing and gave it to Newt and said, Here. And he had this little speaker horn. And now Newt could talk to the football team while they were rehearsing and practicing. That guy was Al Khan. Al Khan went on to form a great company. He called it his electric voice. Al Khan formed Electro Voice. Went on to own Tintech. He was a great, wonderful, powerful man in electronics. Where did he get his knowledge? Amateur radio. Art Collins. All of these guys, you think about all these great companies it all came because of their love of amateur radio. As we got into the hi-fi world, there were so many guys that got into it. We would not have Ampex tape recorders. We wouldn't have television because of all of the things that amateur radio brought into there. We don't think about their education. We don't really know where many of them went to school because we really don't care. It came from ham radio. <laughs> and we could be here all night citing examples. But even today, when you look at many of the software companies and all of the computer things, it was all because of ham radio. We wouldn't have an Apple computer 
Think about that. The Apple computer, yes, yes, Steve Jobs was an incredible visionary marketer and all of that. But who built the Apple computer? It was Wozniak, and he is a ham. <laughs> These are things that we need to, to think about and base all of our goings on in the next hundred years and the fact that if it wasn't because of amateur radio, we wouldn't have many of these things. And I'm very proud to be a member of the ARRL. I've been a life member for a long time, <laughs> back in the 70s, I think, because we have to have some organization to keep us together or we have no direction. And this way we do have a direction. But the main direction we have is one. I talk about it a lot when I talk to many clubs. I do a lot of club meetings these days. Clubs need programming. Clubs get dormant. Clubs are boring, many. So, Gordon, George, myself, we do meetings via Skype. And we are really waking up a lot of clubs because now they have a purpose to come to a club meeting. And we can teach things. And, and that, that's what we have to do today. We have to share this. And so many guys, I don't know why we aren't sharing it. You say, well, the kids don't come to meetings. Why? Because we're boring. Well, we don't have to be. We have the most exciting hobby on the planet. And you pick out which part you want. But it's all exciting. And uh, I love doing these club meetings because we're sharing what we learned the past 100 years. And if we don't continue that and keep these kids out there cooking on what we're doing, then we're going to lose it. We're not going to lose it. We're not going to lose it. Carol Perry is going to make sure of that. All of us together, we need to continue this hobby, share it on, because this 100 years was a, a wonderful time for all of us. But we've got to make that next step and take it into the next century and make sure that amateur radio is as important then as it has been all through the past 100 years. I really appreciate you inviting me to be here. I had a wonderful time. What a great organization you have. And I really, really hope that all of us can make a lot from the next 100 years. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you on the air. And get on the air. Make those transmitters warm. That concludes our old and new look at Bob Heil, K9EID, founder of Heil Sound in 1982 and developer of audio technologies for concert venues and hams everywhere. I'm Kent Peterson, KC0DGY, bidding you a very 73. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Dubai. That's where I was earlier this week. Then before that, Jordan and Oman and Egypt and Israel and Greece. Oh, man. Traveled the world. You know what? You see iPhones everywhere. In fact, technology, you know, it started with television, American television. Uh, I was talking to one of my, one of my guides in, uh, in Dubai. I like to get a guide, a local guide, take me around, show me the stuff. And, and uh, she said uh, her accent was flawless. And I said, wow, uh, you must have studied in the U.S., she said, no, American TV. <laughs> I thought she sounded a little like Mannix, I have to admit. But she, no, American TV. That's what she said. That's how I learned. And uh, she wasn't the first to say that. I actually had a guide in Japan once who said, I learned how to speak English from the Carpenters, singing Carpenters songs. <laughs> so whatever it takes. I guess he was an older gentleman. Maybe that was from the radio era. She was from the TV era. Then uh, there was the internet. Of course, you don't learn how to speak from that. You learn how to read, though, English and write English. And the, I, t I can't tell you, uh, one of the things that's really changed about travel now, when you travel around the world, English is the lingua franca. It's the language kind of everybody speaks. And, of course, that's good because as an American, I speak no other tongue. <laughs> this is it. It's, it's American or nothing. And uh, fortunately, they all speak American, so I felt right at home. Thank you. But I think, you know, the next uh, thing, technology, right? Not just internet, but, but things like 
speech assistants, everything that we use, you know, it, it's, of course, the internet is not English only. And you know that you've, you know, it's occasionally stumble on a site in a different language. It's like, what? Google even translates it for you. By the way, that Google Translate, that's a heck of a thing. As you're traveling around, if you don't mind being a little dorky, you can just uh, press the button on your phone and say, you know, shove it in their face. They speak into that, and they speak, and then it translates it in English and tells me, and then I say, well, thank you very much, which way to the men's room, and then it speaks it and translates that into Arabic, and they, it's incredible. And it, it seems to work. It makes people giggle. I didn't have to use it that much, as I said, because a lot of people seem to speak English pretty well. But anyway, that was a, you know, it's interesting to see how much technology has homogenized the world. iPhones everywhere. New York, Sunday New York Times, today's New York Times, which has a picture of a wet, grumpy cat on the front of it, <laughs> which is a very funny picture, is, a, is all about the Internet. And, uh, and, the, and the headline is, so the Internet didn't turn out the way we hoped. Hmm. It didn't turn out kind of... But, you know, you can't predict how things like this are going to happen. Do you think, uh, the f you know, when the first auto was invented, people knew what would happen from, you know, <laughs> fast forward a hundred some years and, and, and wow. When, when uh, TV was invented, well, maybe they had some idea of what it would be like or radio. But uh, the Internet is, is uh, uh, kind of unpredictable. Unpredictable. So this is a, a very interesting piece on, I guess, uh, the idea that the Internet has not, not only not turned out as we expected, but it's turned out in ways to it's kind of negative. This is the trend, by the way. I almost want to buck this trend. The new thing is, oh, everything is rotten. <laughs> we blew it. We screwed it up. Okay, boomers. <laughs> it's all your fault. <laughs> that kind of thing. And, uh, and, and uh, of course, one of the brunts of this is uh, what used to be the shining exemplar of how everything is wonderful, the technology industry. And now all of a sudden, no, oh, we don't know oh, Google, oh, Facebook. Oh. I was just reading a, a review uh, by a friend, Ron Amadio, in the Ars Technica of the new Google uh, phone, the Pixel 4. And he's just so cranky. <laughs> it's just, it's such a negative review on on a phone that is perfectly fine. I mean... Did we, for, did we forget what a miracle it is that we have in our pocket? A high-definition camera, a always-connected internet device, the ability to communicate with anyone anywhere in the world instantaneously, to watch TV videos, to listen to audio, podcasts, and radio, and all of this is in our pocket. Did we forget that? Yeah, but it's got a really ugly chin on the... It's got... It's, it's so expensive. I don't know. I understand. You, you know, you're a reviewer. You got to find the negative in life. You got, or, you know, that's part of the job of the reviewer. People often, you know, hate critics because that's what they do. Criticize. They're critics. But at the same time, let's not forget. So here's uh, the article from the New York Times, the Sunday Times Magazine, <laughs> with Grumpy Cat in a variety of <laughs> unpleasant states, muddied. It's an illustration. I don't think Grumpy ever, po Grumpy's gone now, right? He's passed away. That's a sad thing. A cleaner internet if you can pay is the headline. And Kevin Roos, who's a very good uh, tech reporter, one of the best out there, is is talking about an interesting phenomenon, which is as the internet gets more and more junked up with ads and, and spyware and surveillance, the people who will have the clean internet will be the people who can afford it. There is a... Uh, an, an income inequality, a, a, a gap in the Internet experienced by people who can pay. Well, I, we were talking yesterday with Scott Wilkinson about Hulu. He said, I don't like Hulu. I have to pay for it and I get ads. And I said, well, you just don't pay enough, Scott. You can absolutely get an ad-free Hulu if you're willing to pay. An ad-free almost anything if you're willing to pay. And, he, you know, he's got a good point. Uh, this isn't how it was supposed to be. In the, in the early days, he quotes Tim Berners-Lee, the man who invented the World Wide Web. What happened? He said, in the old days, I could email anybody. It doesn't matter whether their account was Facebook or Google. But what's happening is people are walling off. They're creating, in effect, a walled, gated community, right? If you can afford it, you're inside. If you're not, well, sorry about your slow internet. 
Sorry about all those ads. Sorry about. There was a Pew uh, study that just came out this week. They do a lot of uh, surveys of people, and it was it had a kind of shocking uh, conclusion that most Americans, the vast majority of Americans, think it's impossible to go through life without being surveilled by private industry and and government that there's no way you can you know 60 percent of adults believe they cannot avoid data collection by corporations 81 percent think the risks of corporate data collection outweigh the benefits i have friends who will argue opposite that you know there are you know with all the benefits we talk about all the time from the internet and even from google that there's a lot of benefit i think there's a lot of benefit but people are clearly concerned. And I don't know if that's the drumbeat cause. I have a feeling it's not uh, just on. I don't think. I don't know. What do you tell me? On your own, would you just think of this? Or is it that the, the media is always saying, oh, yeah, they're spying on you? Because I'll tell you one thing. And, I, you know, I understand. And you're, we all have a, a right to privacy if it's not explicit in the Constitution. I think we do have a, a right to be private in our lives. I also think there's a benefit to trading away some of that privacy. You know, when you when I arrive at the airport, uh, my Android phone pops up a little notification saying, "Oh, your flight is uh, is at gate forty three, terminal two. It's on time. That's okay, right?" And it knows that because it knows my travel plans because Google, you know, looks at my Gmail or whatever. Yeah, I don't. I, that's okay. What about the next step when it says, oh, no, I know you like a, a Frappuccino before your flight, and there's a Starbucks on your left, fifteen feet away. What about that? And what if Starbucks paid for that placement? What about that? I don't know. Maybe I want that Frappuccino. <laughs> These are the conversations we need to have, but I don't think you want to necessarily say all, all of this is bad, except that this, this drumbeat is going on. They're, they're taking our private stuff. And often uh, they don't have a concrete description of what the peril of that is. That's the other problem. Well, you know, they... They know where you're, when your flight's leaving. Yeah. Well, isn't that awful? Uh, no. Well, uh, someday that'll be bad. The government will come and get you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> if I were a fugitive from justice, I might agree. It's bad for fugitives from justice. I'll, I'll grant you that. I don't know. What do you think? I, I think sometimes we overstate the, the bad stuff and we maybe sometimes understate the, the bad stuff as well. I, it, we're, we live in interesting times, the old Chinese curse. We definitely live in interesting times, but I don't think it's all bad or all good. And I think we have, uh, as citizens, probably the duty and, and right to talk about it, to figure out what we want, what we're comfortable with, what we're not comfortable with. I think maybe part of the the anxiety that's going on comes from the feeling that even if we decided we didn't like it there'd be nothing we could do about it that we can no longer count on government to stop google or facebook or you know I, honestly i'm not on facebook i stopped using facebook i decided about a, a year and a half ago i didn't like what facebook stood for and uh, i could you know i can live with the fact that i'm not constant touch with my high school sweetheart and my family second cousin twice removed some people, they say, well, I don't, maybe I don't like Facebook, but I need that. And okay, then there, then there's a problem, right? But I think you have a choice. We're not forced to do this. If you carry a smartphone, you're carrying a pretty good surveillance device. But let's not, uh, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. It's off, you know, we're getting a lot of benefit. Let's not forget. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. In our last installment, we traced the development of FM and repeaters from 1932 up to 1970. Since the FCC rules at that time had no provision for repeater operation, stations and repeater service were operated under the Part 97 provisions covering remote control. 
The FCC, in February 1970, came out with docket number 18803, which set forth the Commission's proposed repeater rules. These included small subbands set aside for repeater operation, a ban on linked, cross-band, and multi-band repeaters, a requirement for whistle-on or other tone control, and a requirement that the licensee of a repeater station be in attendance at the transmitter or at an authorized fixed control point to monitor all transmissions of the station. In regards to the two-meter band, the FCC set up the repeater subband in such a way that two-thirds of it would not be accessible to technicians. Reaction was quick and negative. The ARRL and others felt that the proposed rules were so restrictive that they might be the end of amateur repeater operation as it existed at the time. Counterproposals, far less restrictive than the FCC's, were submitted to the Commission. While amateurs waited for the revised FCC rules, another problem had to be solved. When 2-meter FM operation started in the 1960s, 146.94 had been chosen as the national simplex frequency. This was the highest wideband FM frequency available to technicians. After repeaters came along, amateurs discovered that the surplus commercial equipment in use at that time had a maximum bandwidth of 600 kilohertz. Thus, 146.34 was chosen for the first repeater input. However, in areas where 9.4 was already in heavy use by simplex stations, 146.76 was then chosen as the output. This led to the problem of non-standard splits, and in some areas of the countries, repeaters such as 3.4.76, 2.8.94, and 3.4.8.94 were found. could be found. The frequency 146.94 was a battleground between the simplex versus repeater groups. Amateurs were also fighting a minor battle over 146.64 MHz, which in some parts of the country was a DX simplex frequency. To make matters worse, all transceivers back then were crystal controlled. With crystals at $10 per pair, it cost $120 or about $450 today, to fill all 12 channels in a 2-meter radio. It was possible to equip your radio with the repeaters and simplex frequencies used in one area and then find all of your channels were useless 200 miles away. A national plan was needed. The Texas VHF FM Society proposed such a plan, which was described in the May 1972 issue of QST. In it, the repeater offset was standardized at 600 kilohertz. 146.94 and 146.64 became repeater outputs. 146.4 through 146.58 became simplex, and 146.52 was chosen as the national simplex frequency. In the 146 through 147 megahertz range, accessible to technicians and above, there were 13 repeaters and 7 simplex channels. The 147 through 148 range, available only to generals and above, had 14 repeater and 6 simplex channels. Note that in the Texas plan, all repeater inputs were 600 kHz below the output, even in the 147 through 148 MHz range. Except for changing the inputs to the high side, above 147 MHz, the Texas plan was adopted. The gradual acceptance of a 2-meter band plan still did not resolve the FCC issue. The Texas plan, as good as it was, violated the FCC's 1970 proposal. The Commission still had not issued any repeater rules, nor had they acted on the ARRL's 1969 request to give technicians the full 2-meter band. Finally, in September 1972, the FCC issued new rules covering repeaters, logging, portable, and mobile operations. Liberal repeater subbands were authorized at 52 through 54, 146 through 148, 222 through 225, and 442 through 450 megahertz. Logging requirements, especially for repeater and mobile stations, was simplified. Repeater operators no longer needed a tape recorder hooked up to their stations. The requirement for a portable or mobile station to notify the FCC of operation in a particular radio district was also reduced. 
No longer would amateurs contemplating a cross-country trip with their radios have to write to each district on their journey in order to inform the FCC engineer in charge about the trip. Repeaters would have to be licensed. Call signs beginning with the prefix WR would be issued. The repeater license application was complex. Each applicant for a repeater license had to submit certain data to the FCC regarding the technical, operational, and effective radiated power of the proposed station. Whistle on or tone control was no longer required. Two repeaters could be linked, but multi-linked or cross-band repeaters were prohibited. Repeater monitoring and control requirements were made more flexible. And finally, the FCC acted in part on the ARRL's 1969 proposal. Although they did not give technicians full two-meter privileges, they did grant them access to the 147 through 148 megahertz segment. Technicians could now operate all two-meter repeaters without violating FCC rules. The new FCC repeater rules, coupled with the Texas plan, caused a surge in two-meter FM activity. It also was the shot in the arm the hobby needed to fully recover from the decrease in growth caused by incentive licensing. Manufacturers such as Drake, Standard, Regency, Tempo, Genève, Clegg, and Midland poured rigs onto the amateur market. Heathkit had the very successful HW202, followed by the even more popular HW2036. The increase in the number of technicians on 2-meter FM finally killed the technicians are experimenters, not communicators theory. And finally, thanks to 2-meter FM, amateur radio grew by over 33% in the 1970s. In 1975, due to increased demand, the FCC authorized the use of 144.5 to 145.5 MHz for repeater operation. Technicians were given access to this subband. In 1978, the FCC relaxed the rules, eliminated the separate repeater license and the WR prefix, and gave technicians the full 2-meter band. From 1978 through 1981, the synthesized revolution took place, as affordable PLL and microprocessor rigs drove the last of the crystal-controlled radios off the market. Today, a name brand 2-meter HT costs about $135. With it, you can access over 4,000 repeaters or scan the VHF high band. Compare that to 1972, when a crystal-controlled radio equipped with 12 channels cost $300 or about $900 today. We have truly come a long way. In our next installment, we will look at a couple of licensed proposals in the mid-1970s and the controversy they caused. I hope you will join me. A group of amateurs is hosting a DX Expedition Boot Camp in the South Pacific, offering the expertise of experienced ops to help those who hope to do it for real sometimes. The station on Norfolk Island offers CW and single sideband from 160 through 10 meters, with dedicated stations for FT8 and 6 meters, along with a variety of dipole and vertical antennas. A short drive from the DX Expedition station is Mount Bates, where interested operators can try their hand at summits on the air activation. Norfolk Island National Park is also adjacent to the DX Expedition Station. The camp will take place from March 17th to the 31st, 2023. For information about costs and other details, visit their website at DX Expedition Boot Camp, that's all one word, dot net. DX Expedition Boot Camp dot net. And here's a bonus. Meals are included. Bruce Page, KK5DO, has filed his weekly AMSAT report, and as expected, FalconSat 3 has re-entered. After more than five years in operation, the satellite has met its demise. LUSAT, or LO19, is now 33 years old, and it was Argentina's first satellite. You can listen to it on 437.125. Some of the older satellites are hanging in there, as is evident by the lifespan of AO7. Do you need a speaker for a club meeting, one that will discuss working satellites? Well, Bruce's good friend Clint, K6LCS, has been doing Zoom meetings for clubs around the country. As a matter of fact, he just did one for Bruce's local club. To contact him, visit work-sat.com for information about those Zoom meetings. 
Satellite operation is a lot of fun. Whether you like FM, SSB, or digital, you can find satellite and plenty of ops that are available on them. Sometimes the satellites are very busy. Other times they're quiet. Also, you might be using the repeater on the International Space Station, and an astronaut will pick up the mic and begin making contacts. If you've not tried this facet of the hobby, you might consider it. It is time for the weekly propagation forecast report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports that solar activity softened again this week with the average daily sunspot numbers changing from 162 to 80.7 and solar flux from 198.9 to 139.5. This represents quite a dramatic shift from the excitement of a couple of weeks ago. To review, average daily weekly sunspot numbers from the first report of 2023 went from 97 to 135.9, 173.4 and 162. The average weekly solar flux went from 157.8 to 181.2, 221.8 and 198.9. This variability is expected. Soon, perhaps, in the next solar rotation, activity will rise once again. The graphs we see of smooth sunspot numbers are smooth because the numbers are averaged over a whole year. Geomagnetic numbers barely changed at all, with the planetary A index changing only from 8.1 to 7.9. The middle latitude numbers did not change at all, 5.9 last week and 5.9 again this week. So taking a look at the predicted solar flux, it will be 140 on February 3rd through the 5th, 145 on the 6th, 150 on February 7th through the 9th, 155 on the 10th through the 13th, and 160 on February 14th through the 16th. Looking at the predicted planetary A index, it'll be 5 on February 3rd through the 5th, 8 on February 6th through the 9th, 12, 5, 8, and 8 on the 10th through the 13th, respectively, and 5 on February 14th through the 17th. In Radio Sport this week, don't forget the year-long ARRL Volunteers on the Air VOTA event. You can also see the state activations scheduled for the weekly W1AW portable operations, including these. February 1st to the 7th, South Carolina, W1AW slash 4. February 1st to the 7th, South Dakota, W1AW slash 0. February 8th through the 14th, Hawaii, W1AW KH6. And on February 8th through the 14th as well, Georgia, W1AW slash 4. And some upcoming contests to be aware of, February 4th through the 5th, the Vermont QSO Party, CW Phone and Digital there. February 4th and 5th, the 1010 International Winter Contest, Single Sideband and Phone. February 4th, the Eurasia HF Championship, that's CW and Phone. February 4th through the 5th, the F9AA Cub, that's CW. And on February 4th through the 5th, it's the Mexico RTTY International Contest, and that, of course, is digital. The Irish Radio Transmitting Society are reporting the SSTV unit aboard the ISS has completely failed. The interface card connecting the radios with a computer suffered damage beyond repair. New laptops are also being used, which require new interface components from the ARIS Russia team. ARIS Russia is developing this new interface and is consulting the ARIS International Hardware and Software team. Sergei Sambarov, RV3DR, stated that they don't expect to complete the SSTV development efforts until early 2024, and the hardware will be transported to the ISS on a progress flight later in 2024. Until then, there will be no more slow-scan television coming from the space station. Fade to black. Internet Archive's digital library of amateur radio and communications is quickly growing to become an important archive of radio's past and present. The collection has blossomed to well over 51,000 items related to ham radio, shortwave listening, scanners, and related communications. The newest editions include books, journals, and magazines, newsletters, and archives of early internet discussion lists. More than 3,300 books and magazines are now available via controlled digital lending in the DLARC Lending Library. These materials, including hundreds of magazine and journal issues, including popular electronics, RF design, and general radio experimenter, can be borrowed for online or offline reading, one reader at a time, by anyone with a free Internet Archive account. The DLARC has also added Amateur Radio Magazine's QST from 1912 to 1961, Radio and Television News from 1919 to 1959, and Radio Magazine from 1920 to 1947. Nearly 1,300 episodes of The Rain Report 
an audio program that aired news and interviews relevant to the amateur radio community from 1985 to 2019 are now available, including hundreds of lost episodes, thanks to the help of the program's producer, Hap Holly. DLARC has also added the 700-episode library of the National Radio Club DX Audio Service, which reported radio-related news from 1985 through 2015. The DLARC also is hosting the entire library of This Week in Amateur Radio newscasts. The archive of radio-related podcasts now includes QSO Today, Linux in the Ham Shack, Amateur Logic, and others. Radio clubs are utilizing the DLARC archive to provide long-term backup of content and increase their visibility to new audiences. The Milwaukee Radio Amateurs Club, one of the oldest ham radio groups, for example, is uploading its entire historical archive, an unparalleled collection of newsletters, correspondence, newspaper clippings, and meeting minutes documenting the group's history. Other group newsletters include British Amateur Television Club's CQTV, the CW Ops Solid Copy Newsletter for Morse Code Enthusiasts, Boulder Amateur Television Club TV Repeater's Repeater, and Scope, the newsletter of the Palomar Amateur Radio Club. The DLARC Library has also added newsletters from radio clubs around the world, including the Dutch Amateur Radio Union, the Chester and District Radio Society in England, and the defunct Canadian Amateur Radio Operators Association. The site now archives papers and presentation slides from 41 years of Tuscan Amateur Packet Radio Conferences, including the ARRL and TAPR Digital Communications Conference and the Computer Networking Conference. The collection is accessible like never before, full-text searchable and with detailed metadata. In addition, TAPR's Packet Status Register newsletter, published since 1982, is also archived. DLARC has also begun archiving amateur radio email discussion lists, so far making tens of thousands of discussion threads available and searchable, going as far back as the late 1980s for the first time in decades. The selection includes InfoHams Digest, Boat Anchors, a mailing list for fans of vacuum tube radios, Packet Radio Digest, and Ham Digital Digest. The DLARC is funded by a significant grant from the Amateur Radio Digital Communications to create a digital library that documents, preserves, and provides open access to the history of this community. The Digital Library of Amateur Radio and Communications invites radio clubs and individuals to submit collections of material, whether they are already in digital format or not. Anyone with material to contribute, questions about the project, or interest in creating a digital library for other professional communities, please contact K. Savets, K6, KJN, Program Manager, Special Collections, via email to kay at archive.org. In the combat jungles of Vietnam, he was a link to the outside world for his fellow Marine infantrymen. William Hunter Kilburn of Aiken, South Carolina, was a radio telephone operator carrying a radio and an antenna for vital communications. In May of 1970, another Marine tripped a wire attached to a Viet Cong booby trap, and the Aiken High School graduate, who had been walking behind him, was killed. His hometown remembers him well, but even more than that, the American Legion Radio Club, W4RTO, has chosen to honor him. The Ham Radio Club, established at the Post less than a year ago, now carries the Marine's name. There's a plaque at the Post headquarters identifying the site as the home of Private First Class William H. Kilburn, Post 26, American Legion Radio Club. On January 24th, the club members also approved William Kilburn as an honorary member. The military had earlier awarded him a medal for combat valor. Now he serves as an inspiration in his home community where club members help youngsters study to get their radio license and where many members are looking for ways to deepen their own commitment to service in their own way. Foundations of Amateur Radio Sometimes you learn mind-boggling things about this hobby, often when you least expect it. Recently I discussed having my 20 milliwatt whisper or weak signal propagation reporter beacon heard on the other side of the planet, in Denmark, 13,612 kilometres away. That in and of itself is pretty spectacular, 
but it gets better if you consider just how weak the signal was by the time it got there. In radio communications, there's a concept called path loss or path attenuation. Until recently, I understood this to mean the things that impede a signal getting from transmitter to receiver. That includes coax and connector losses, refraction across the ionosphere, reflection off the surface of the planet, and diffraction around objects. It turns out there is another factor called free space path loss to consider. It's loosely defined as the loss of signal strength between two antennas. The name sort of implies that something happens to the signal in free space, which is odd if you know that in space radio waves, regardless of frequency, travel without loss, and will travel pretty much indefinitely. So what's going on? To get started, think about a dome lawn sprinkler, one of those little round discs that sits on the ground with the hose connected to the side. You turn on the tap and the water sprays in all directions. If you're really close to the sprinkler when the tap is turned on, you'll get sopping wet almost immediately, since most of the water will hit you directly. This is particularly fun in the heat of summer on New Year's Day in Australia, not so much in the middle of winter on the other side of the globe. If you stand a couple of metres away, you'll still get wet, eventually, but it will take much longer because most of the water isn't hitting you. If you stand even further away, and assuming the water still gets that far, it will take even longer. A small towel and a big towel will both take the same length of time to get wet if they're held at the same distance from the sprinkler. But if you wring them both out, you'll discover that the big towel captured much more water during the same time. In radio communications, we can combine these two ideas, the distance and the size of the receiver, to describe free space path loss. The further away from the transmitter you are, the less signal is available to you to capture since much of the signal is not heading in your direction, and the bigger your antenna, the more signal you receive. The bigger the antenna, the lower the frequency, which is why you'll discover that free space path loss is dependent on both distance and frequency. To give you an idea of scale, the free space path loss for 28 MHz over 13,000 km is about 144 dB. While the name free space path loss implies loss of signal across the path in free space, the loss is not due to distance as such, rather it's caused by how much the signal is spread out in space. Similarly, there isn't more loss because the frequency is increased. It's that less signal is captured by the smaller size or aperture of the antenna required for a higher frequency. So perhaps a better name might be spherical and aperture loss, but then everyone would have to learn how to spell that, so free space path loss it is. I'll point out that this is the minimum theoretical loss. In reality, the loss is higher than this, since it also includes all the other parts of the path loss, which are things that we can control, like coax and connector loss, and things we can improve by frequency selection, like ionospheric reflection and refraction, which depend on solar conditions. The one aspect of path loss that we have no control over is the free space path loss, so perhaps that's why we don't talk about it very much. I'll mention that in path loss calculations, often antenna gain at the transmitter and receiver are used to reduce any path loss figures. If I have an antenna with 6 dB gain, then that reduces my overall path loss by 6 dB, which is why we spend so much time and effort figuring out what antenna to use when we get on air to make noise. I mentioned that the free space path loss for my beacon between Australia and Denmark was about 144 dB. This means that my 20 milliwatt signal arrived in Denmark as a minus 131 dBm signal. That might not mean much, but that's the equivalent of about 80 atto watts. If you're not sure how big that is, 1 milliwatt is 1 quadrillion atto watts, a 1 with 15 zeros. Said another way, 1 watt is 1000 milliwatts. 1 milliwatt is 1000 microwatts. 1 microwatt is 1000 nanowatts, 1 nanowatt is 1000 picowatts, 1 picowatt is 1000 femtowatts, and 1 femtowatt is 1000 attowatts. It might come as a surprise, but these numbers are not unusual. Don't believe me? When your radio shows an S0 signal on HF, it is defined as minus 127 dBm. So we deal with tiny numbers like this all the time. We're just not quite aware of it on a daily basis. Remember, my numbers are theoretical only, to give you an idea of scale. 
In reality, everything in the path between the transmitter and receiver affects what ends up at the other end, and might make the difference between hearing someone or not. I'm Honor, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. New rules aimed at making the emergency alert system more resilient to cyber hacks being proposed by the Federal Communications Commission are drawing fire from broadcasters. Industry groups say that while protecting EAS is a laudable goal, the rules being contemplated are unnecessary and would do little to make the system more secure. The Commission launched a rulemaking in PS Docket number 22-329 that would require radio and other EAS participants to report incidents of unauthorized access to their EAS equipment within 72 hours. Participants would need to report any cyber hack incidents. The FCC is also considering requiring participants to annually certify that they are using sufficient security measures and to certify each year that they have a risk management plan in place. FCC Chairperson Jessica Rosenworcel said back in October that their efforts would help ensure EAS and the wireless alert system are functional during an emergency. But the National Association of Broadcasters calls the proposals expansive and expensive and says it will not meaningfully enhance the operational readiness or security of EAS. The NAB says there is also scant evidence that EAS equipment failures and cybersecurity issues are a widespread problem, and that based on a, quote, relatively meager number, unquote, of equipment problems that popped up during the 2021 national test, the FCC is now proposing an entirely new regulatory regime in place of one that's currently working. Even if additional examination of EAS reliability and security was warranted, the proposed reporting, certification, and cyber management obligations are far too complex and costly for many EAS participants to implement. That includes what the trade group says would be a complicated process of trying to determine each year if a sufficient cybersecurity risk management plan is in place. Rather than adopting new requirements, NAB suggests the FCC do more to provide grassroots-level training and assistance. It says working with participants such as small and medium-sized broadcasters that are most likely to lag in updating their equipment or software would be a better course to take. This voluntary option would also facilitate the rapid resolution of EAS defects, speed the implementation of software patches designed to enhance security, and improve alert monitoring, among other benefits. New York Public Radio says its experience on 9-11, and more recently during the pandemic, has demonstrated that the greatest amount of remote operation capability possible is needed to provide continuous coverage. Current rules requiring hands-on control and maintenance requirements negate remote operational functions which, ironically, are most likely to occur during an emergency when EAS messaging to the public is most important. The public broadcaster says the FCC should take the fullest possible advantage of the capabilities that 21st century technology has to offer. AI, artificial intelligence, can now apparently carry on a passable conversation depending on what you classify as passable conversation. Radio amateur William Franzen, VE4VR, has put a little artificial intelligence on the airwaves by creating a voice assistant powered by OpenAI's controversial chat GPT, accessible using a radio on the 2-meter and 70-centimeter bands. In this case, we're using a D-Star digital voice repeater on VHF, Franson explains, of the project, which will receive my test transmission, which is digital voice, and then that's sent over the internet to a server in a data center, which has a Northwest Digital Radio Thumb DV-AMBE transcoder plugged into it. The voice is transcoded to plain digital voice. It's run through a speech-to-text engine, which is then run through a chat GPT, 
and then all the way back, transcoded, and comes back to the radio. OpenAI launched ChatGPT last November, offering a simple web chat-like interface to its text-based generative adversarial network technology. Type in a message, and ChatGPT replies, mimicking understanding, but, in reality, simply stringing together the statistically most likely words you would expect from a response. Its flexibility has captured plenty of imaginations, but the technology has come in for criticism, too, ranging from its tendency to make up facts as it goes along to its potential uses for academic cheating or malicious compositions. Those who are on the side of being interested in, rather than concerned about, the technology have already begun to integrate it into other projects, typically using unofficial Python APIs. We can now ask questions from anywhere, Franson explains, demonstrating by keying up and asking ChatGPT's radio personality the easiest way to obtain an amateur radio license and receiving a surprisingly detailed answer in return. You can talk to the service now from anywhere you can get a radio signal. Franson's video demonstration is available on YouTube. The source code has not been released as we come to air this week. An old rocket body and military satellite, large pieces of space junk dating back to the Soviet Union, nearly smashed into each other this past Friday morning in an uncomfortable near miss that would have resulted in thousands of pieces of debris had they collided. Leo Labs, a private company that tracks satellites and derelict objects in low Earth orbit, spotted the near collision in radar data. The company, which can track objects as tiny as 3.9 inches or 10 centimeters in diameter, operates three radar stations, two in the U.S. and one in New Zealand. The two objects whizzed past each other at an altitude of 611 miles or just 984 kilometers on the morning of Friday, January 27th. Leo Labs computed a missed distance of only 6 meters or 20 feet with an error margin of only a few tenths of a meter, the company said in a tweet. That is unbelievably close, as Harvard Smithsonian astrophysicist Jonathan McDowell conveyed in a graphic posted to Twitter. The SL-8 rocket body, specifically its second stage, had been in space since 1986, while the Cosmos 2361 military satellite, known as Paris, launched to low Earth orbit in 1998. A collision between the two objects would have produced thousands of new debris fragments that would have lingered in Earth orbit for decades. The conjunction happened in an orbital bad neighborhood located between 590 and 652 miles above the surface, according to Leo Labs. This band has significant debris generating potential in low Earth orbit due to a mix of breakup events and abandoned derelict objects, the company explained in a series of tweets. The so-called bad neighborhood hosts around 160 SL-8 rocket bodies along with their roughly 160 payloads launched decades ago. Leo Labs says around 1,400 conjunctions involving these rocket bodies were chronicled between June and September 2022. Leo Labs describes this type of potential collision between two massive derelict objects as a worst-case scenario, saying it would be largely out of our control and would likely result in a ripple effect of dangerous collision encounters. Indeed, a collision on this scale would most certainly accelerate the ongoing Kessler syndrome, the steady accumulation of space debris that threatens to make portions of Earth's orbit inaccessible. Near misses in space are becoming increasingly common, whether it's conjunctions between defunct satellites or clouds of debris that threaten the International Space Station. Avoidance maneuvers are now a steady fixture for satellite operators, with SpaceX as an extreme example, having to perform over 26,000 collision avoidance maneuvers of its Starlink satellites from December 1st, 2020 to November 30th, 2022. In addition to focusing on collision avoidance, Leo Labs recommends the implementation of debris mitigation and debris remediation efforts. This could take the form of sensible guidelines having to do with the removal of satellites once they've been retired, as well as the introduction of debris removal technologies. Astronauts on board the International Space Station were busy the last week of January making contacts with two schools using amateur radio. 
John Ross, KD8IDJ, reports. The amateur radio on the International Space Station, known as ARIS program, arranged contacts with the Brentwood Magnet Elementary School in Raleigh, North Carolina, and the Norwich Free Academy, located in Norwich, Connecticut. On January 26, nearly 400 students at Brentwood Magnet Elementary School filled the gymnasium to listen to astronaut Kochi Wakata answer questions about his experience on the ISS. Wakata told students he loves being in space, but is looking forward to taking a shower when he returns in March. Then on January 30th, astronaut Josh Casada contacted students at the Norwich Free Academy. During his 10-minute contact, Casada shared with students how his career as a Navy test pilot helped him become an astronaut. Do the things you love, Casada told the students. And during the remainder of that contact, Casada talked about cargo vehicles making frequent trips to resupply the ISS and how his daily routine is different every day, including working weekends. ARIS is a unique STEM educational program which inspires young people to develop knowledge and skills through their participation in space, science, and amateur radio. ARIS conducts 60 to 80 of these special amateur radio contacts each year between students around the globe and crew members with ham radio license aboard the International Space Station. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. The Norwich Free Academy Amateur Radio and Engineering Club, W1HLO members and advisors, installed an amateur radio satellite ground station on the NFA campus in 2023 thanks to an amateur radio digital communications grant, which helped make the contact with the ISS possible. ARIS is a cooperative venture of international amateur radio societies and the space agencies that support the ISS. In the United States, participating organizations include from NASA's Space Communications and Navigation Program, the ISS National Lab Space Station Explorers, the ARRL, and AMSAT. The Virginia QSO Party and Virginia's Volunteers on the Air Activation of W1AW Stroke 4 are set for the weekend of March 18th and 19th, 2023. Virginia amateur radio operators will at the same time, celebrate the contribution of thousands of ARRL volunteers during Virginia's activation of the Volunteers on the Air event by contacting W1AW Stroke 4 during the Virginia QSO party. In fact, W1AW Stroke 4 will be active from March 15th through the 21st, 2023. Virginia QSO party planners are working to activate in some of the rare counties to help increase the chances of earning a Worked All VA Counties Award. New Foundation license holders and young amateurs under the age of 24 are being given special recognition in the construction competition organized by the Radio Society of Great Britain. Competitors have until the March 1st deadline to submit their entries in four categories, Beginners, Construction Excellence, Innovation, and Software. This competition is being held over the internet and the judging is taking place online. The RSGB states on its website that the challenges posed are in recognition of the vital role construction plays in amateur radio. Details on how to enter can be found on their website at rsgb.org slash main slash construction dash competition. Cash prizes will be awarded in each category and the overall winner will be presented with bonus of the Pat Hawker G3VA trophy. The trophy is named in honor of Pat, who became a silent key in 2013 at the age of 90. Pat had been the author of the technical topics column in the RSGB's amateur radio publication, Radcom Magazine. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. This month, we'll learn more tower working vocabulary. As some of you may have noticed, tower climbers and owners have a unique vocabulary. For the climber, this is usually a combination of phrases from climbing, caving, and sailing. Sailing, you say? Yes, there are some phrases concerning the use of guys and rope anchors that were originally used in the ancient occupation of a deckhand. Some of these terms from sailing's history are a shackle, or sometimes called a spelter socket. This is part of the guy cable or guy wire that joins the cable to a mounting lug on the tower. This attachment point is called a guy lug. Bridge strand is a common type of steel cable used for guying a tower. Block. This is the common name for a pulley. The diameter of the roller inside the pulley is usually the size spec 
for that pulley. Butterfly clamps are commonly used to hold flexible coax to the tower leg. Common spacing is 6 to 8 feet. Some installers use a short piece of heavy wire with insulation, usually a solid conductor, about 10 gauge copper. Some use these in conjunction with electrical tape or weather resistant cable ties. A cat head is a rope pulling device similar in concept to a come along. These are used on sailboats today and also for pulling lengths of wire or cable. Cat heads can also be motorized for pulling cable or wire through conduit. A bull pin is used to align bolt holes. This steelworking tool is commonly used by tower workers to align bolt holes between tower sections. If you are going to build a tower, a homemade bull pin will save you lots of aggravation. A bull pin is probably available at your local hardware store or can be made from a simple one inch steel rod with a gradual point ground in one end. They are used by hammering into holes to force them into alignment. And now for this month's climbing hint. Many of you folks remember the child's toy commonly called a Chinese finger trap. These flexible woven tubes were things you could stick two fingers into and the harder you pulled, the harder they gripped. There's an electrical device with a similar function made by a company called Kellum, K-E-L-L-U-M. These devices may be found at your hardware store's electrical department. These grippers are used for securing electrical cable, which runs from box to box without any other support. These grippers hold the wire securely and help to prevent it from being pulled out of a box and can easily be modified to grip a coax, then attaching a rope to pull the coax up a tower. If you can't find a Kellum at your hardware store, try asking an electrician that works in a factory or that does commercial work. When hauling coax up towers, use the proper size Kellum to hold the end of the coax. Avoid bending or stressing the coax at the lifting end. This can crack foil shielding and cause crackling when the coax bends in the wind or even fluctuation in SWR. If you've decided to purchase climbing safety gear and chosen to use sport climbing grade belts on towers, when you call their 800 number, don't mention you're going to use it for tower work. Some companies will refuse to do business with you because of their potential liability. This is very much an issue in the sport of recreational climbing, even more so than in the professional tower work. Remember, any time you spend learning about tower safety is an investment in yourself. Education is a big part of tower safety. For a free copy of my tower climbing gear resource list, check it out on the internet at http colon slash slash members.kconline.com slash kf9mp. That's http colon slash slash m-e-m-b-e-r-s dot k-c-o-n-l-i-n-e dot c-o-m slash kilo fox nine mike papa this is greg stoddard kf9 mp reporting for this week in amateur radio like a high-tech hammer of thor a powerful laser can grab hold of a lightning bolt and reroute its path through the sky in a mountaintop experiment, such a laser bent lightning toward a lightning rod, researchers report online January 16th in Nature Photonics. Scientists have used lasers to wrangle electricity in the lab before, but this is the first demonstration that the technique works in real-world storms and could someday lead to better protection against lightning. Today's most common anti-lightning tech is the classic lightning rod, a meters-long metal pole rooted to the ground. The metal's conductivity lures in lightning that might otherwise strike nearby buildings or people, feeding that electricity safely into the earth. But the area shielded by a lightning rod is limited by the rod's height. If you want to protect some large infrastructure, like an airport or a launching pad for rockets, or a wind farm, then you would need, for good protection, a lightning rod of kilometer size or hundreds of meters, says Aurelien Huard, a physicist at Institut Polytechnique de Paris in Palissieux, France. Such a tall metal pole would be impractical, but a laser could reach that far, intercepting distant lightning bolts and ushering them down to ground-based metal rods. Huard and his colleagues tested this idea atop the Santis Mountain in northeastern Switzerland. 
They set up a high-power laser near a telecommunications tower tipped with a lightning rod that is struck by lightning around 100 times every year. The laser was beamed at the sky for about six hours total during thunderstorms from July to September 2021. The laser blasted short, intense bursts of infrared light at the clouds about 1,000 times per second. This train of light pulses ripped electrons off air molecules and knocked some air molecules out of its way, carving out a channel of low-density charged plasma. Sort of like clearing a path through the woods and laying down pavement, this combination of effects made it easier for electric current to flow along this route. That created a path of least resistance for lightning to follow through the sky. Ward's team tuned their laser so that it formed this electrically conductive pathway just above the tip of the tower. This allowed the tower's lightning rod to intercept a bolt snagged by the laser before it zipped all the way down to the laser equipment. The tower was hit by lightning four times while the laser was on. One of those strikes happened in a fairly clear sky, allowing two high-speed cameras to capture the moment. Those images showed lightning zigzagging down from the clouds and following the laser light for some 50 meters toward the tower's lightning rod. To track the paths of the three bolts that they could not see, the researchers looked at radio waves shed by the lightning. Those radio waves showed that the three strikes followed the path of the laser much more closely than other strikes that happened when the laser was off. This hinted that the laser guided these three strikes to the lightning rod as well. It's a real achievement, said Howard Milchberg, a physicist at the University of Maryland in College Park not involved in the work. People have been trying to do this for many years. Scientists' main goal in bending lightning to their will is to increase safety, he says. But if this thing ever became really, really efficient, and the probability of guiding a discharge was increased way beyond what it is now, it could potentially even be useful for charging things up. Atmospheric and space scientist Robert Holsworth is more cautious about imagining the applications. They only showed 50 meters of guiding length, and most lightning channels are kilometers long, said Holsworth, of the University of Washington in Seattle. So scaling the laser system up to have a useful reach may take a lot of work. Using a higher frequency, higher energy laser could extend its reach, Huard said. This is a first step towards a kilometric range lightning rod. Louis E. Fresnel Jr., W5LEF, became a silent key on January 9th, 2023. He was 84 years old. Frenzel was a longtime amateur radio operator and freelance writer. He retired in 2022 after 18 years as technology editor for Electronic Design Magazine. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Houston and a master's degree from the University of Maryland. He taught college-level communications and electronic classes in the Austin, Texas area. His friend and colleague, William G. Wong, Senior Content Director of Electronic Design and Manager of Microwaves and RF, said Frenzel loved technology and loved to teach people while always learning. He was outgoing and always wanted to educate and make complicated technology simple, said Wong. Frenzel's latest and fifth edition of his book, Principles of Electronic Communication Systems, is considered a mainstay for college curricula. Throughout his career, Frenzel served as vice president for several companies, including Heathkit, Longman Crown, and McGraw-Hill. Frenzel was active in amateur radio and held an amateur extra class license. Meanwhile, Raymond Paul Richard, W4RPR of Ocala, Florida, became a silent key on January 30th, 2023. Richard was 65 years old and is survived by his wife of 30 years, Cynthia. He was a member of the Orlando Amateur Radio Club where he served as a past membership chairman. He was also the advanced ticket chairman for the Orlando Hamcation. Serving his community through amateur radio was a passion of Ray, said Orlando Amateur Radio Club President John Knott, N4JTK. In 2019, Ray was awarded the KB4UT Wayne Nelson Amateur of the Year Award for his service and dedication to the Orlando Amateur Radio Club. Richard was a member of the ARRL Maxim Society, a group of individuals recognized for their extraordinary generosity to the association. The amateur radio community and operators in Texas are grieving the loss of an influential colleague of many talents, Professor Emeritus of Linguistics, 
country and bluegrass radio host, recording artist and performer, and, not least of all, active radio amateur. Rodney Moog, W5NDS, was a rag chewer and a popular presence on 10 meters and elsewhere. He became a silent key on Thursday, January 19th at his home in Austin, Texas. Born with juvenile glaucoma, he became blind at the age of seven. He was first licensed in 1951 as W2KUV when he was a 14-year-old student at the New York State School for the Blind. Rod operated almost exclusively on AM and CW for more than 10 years before expanding into other modes. According to his bio on the Quarter Century Wireless Association webpage, he was the only active ham in his high school ham club and continued being active even in college. He remained an active ham throughout most of his 86 years. His talent in music and his academic work in linguistics took him to many places around the world, either touring as a musician or studying languages. In the late 1970s, while teaching at the University of the South Pacific in Fiji, he operated as 3D2RM. He was a former vice president of the Austin Amateur Radio Club, a longtime member of the Texas VHF FM Society, and a life member of ARRL and the QCWA. Planning is getting underway for organizers of this year's Symposium for Maritime Amateur Radio Technology, which is being hosted by the Westcombe Amateur Radio Club in Nova Scotia on May 6, 2023. All of the ham clubs throughout Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and elsewhere play an active role in this annual event, which features a series of one-hour classes throughout the day and a variety of social gatherings. This is the sixth annual event, and its focus is on the technical and procedural aspects of ham radio as it relates to operating in the maritime region. John VE1CWJ will present a class on amateur radio use of satellites. Gordon VE9GC will discuss remote station operation. And Bill VE1YY, Glenn VE9GJ, and Jason VE1PYE will talk about making successful contacts on the 630-meter band. There will also be classes on the use of Winlink radio messaging system and weak signal propagation reporter. Additional details about the event, known as Smart23, can be found on their website that appears in this week's text. Westcom dot ca forward slash smart 23 that's westcom w-e-s-t-c-u-m-b dot ca forward slash s-m-a-r-t-2-3 dx chasers who have their calendars marked for the venuat 2 expedition in december 2024 need to turn their calendar pages back by two months the eight member team has announced that they will instead be heading to the south pacific island for the two-week activation in October of 2024. The operators are hoping to capitalize on the springtime propagation in the Southern Hemisphere and plan to participate in the CQ Worldwide DX phone contest. The activation site will be on the island of Efate, which is the most populated in the nation's archipelago. Efate boasts a robust tourism industry. Spouses and partners will be accompanying the team members whose average age is 70. The operators said they expect to log more than 40,000 QSOs. Vanuatu is 1,500 miles from Sydney, Australia, and 3,000 miles from Honolulu, Hawaii. An amateur astronomer from southwestern Nova Scotia has captured a dazzling time lapse of the green comet C2022E3ZTF while it made its closest approach to Earth on Wednesday. The last time the comet was this close to our planet was 50,000 years ago. Tim Duchette, with the Deep Sky Eye Observatory near Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, is among them. He took a two-hour time lapse of the comet during the early morning hours of January 28th. If you've got a telescope, are in Canada, and you look closely at the comet and the background stars, it's traveling relative in our sky about one quarter degrees per hour, he told CBC's Radio Main Street, Halifax. So within a few minutes, you can see that the comet's actually making motion in the night sky. Meanwhile, a truck-sized asteroid suddenly loomed out of the darkness with the Earth in its sights, 
then sailed harmlessly past us on Thursday, January 26th. Asteroid 2023BU whizzed past without incident and back out into the blackness of space. The rock, which was spotted by an amateur stargazer in Crimea, came close to the southern tip of South America at around 0029 GMT Friday, according to scientists who were tracking it. Also this week, the RSGB has just released another presentation from its 2022 convention. Brian Coleman, G4NNS, talks about the UK Meteor Beacon Project, which is a collaborative project between the amateur radio and radio astronomy communities. The aim is to collect data on meteor events over the UK, and Phase 1 was to establish a transmit beacon. Phase 2 is to create a network of receivers to monitor the radio echoes from meteors and to stream data over the internet to support the study of meteor events and their impact on the ionosphere. The project has received RSGB legacy funds to help make this great idea happen. You can see the presentation on the RSGB YouTube channel and you can find out more about the RSGB Legacy Funds on the Society's website. And finally this week, children as young as five are learning the once groundbreaking form of communication, Morse code, spurred on by K-pop bands who use it to leak hints about upcoming songs to fans. Now whilst the youngsters are learning CW, do you need to learn what K-pop is? K-pop, or Korean pop, is the internationally popular, aesthetic-driven, style-bending, trend-setting music genre of the 21st century. Originating in South Korea, K-pop draws influence from a range of genres like pop, experimental, rock, hip-hop, R&B, electronic, and dance. South Korean boy bands New East and Tomorrow by Together, also known as TXT, have both used Morse code within their music videos and even communicate hints about upcoming songs to fans. At the start of TXT's song Crown, Morse code is used to spell out the title before the song gets underway. Similarly, Nui's song Help Me spells out its title at the start of the song. Nui Stephen has flashing lights communicating in Morse code on their website to reveal the titles of their upcoming songs. This prompted young fans of the bands to scour the internet trying to find out the hidden meaning of the beeps, and Morse was rediscovered. But even the Beatles' Strawberry Fields Forever has at the beginning of the song, right after Lennon sings, Let me take you down, cause I'm going to, a sequence of very faint beeps that spell out the initials JL. The B-52's Planet Claire, pretty much the first 30 seconds is Morse code. The German electronic band Kraftwerk has an entire track on their Radioactivity album that is almost all Morse code. Morse does appear inadvertently on a pop track from the early 70s. Forever immortalized on tubular bells, coastal radio station GBR. The Morse signal from GBR inadvertently entered the Tubular Bells recording and can be heard on the CD and decoded today. This great story features a radio station called Rugby Radio Station that was in Warwickshire in the heart of England, and the famous mansion studio The Manor that Richard Branson of Virgin Records made available to Mike Oldfield for whom he worked at Tubular Bells between 1972 and 1973. The powerful Morse signal leaked its way into the recording equipment. Located 60 kilometers from the manor where Mike Oldfield spent long months producing his great album was Rugby Radio, where it was built at the end of the Great War and during the Second World War it was used as a very low frequency radio station for communication with submarines in the North Atlantic and for telephone service between England and the United States. This station stopped broadcasting in 2003 and closed in 2007. Many of the news and information items heard in this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the Shortwave Listening Post, the Federal Communications Commission, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, The Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, The Rich on Tech Podcast, courtesy of Premier Networks, The International Telecommunications Union, The 425DX News, Parks on the Air and The Soda Reflector, and various news sources on the Internet. 
This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on the internet, on low-power FM stations, and on great repeater systems like the WB3GXW repeater on 147.225 MHz in Silver Springs, Maryland, serving all of Silver Springs and also covering the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. WB3GXW can also be found on Echolink Conference Server Node 6154. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w2xbs77 at gmail.com. That address once again is w 2 xbs 77 at gmail.com. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers.